that hymn ends in a beautiful note, Lord, make us free. And we know that God has freed us from the power of sin on account of Jesus' death on the cross, his sacrifice, his life that he has given for us. Sometimes we don't always feel that freedom, though. And we know that we stumble or we do things that hurt others or go against God and go against God's desires for us. Now is the time in the service to remember God's grace, to appeal towards that grace, to let go of that guilt that we might have upon our hearts as we confess our sin first together, using the prayer in our bulletin. If you feel so moved to join us in saying that prayer, and then silently and personally after that. Please join with me in our prayer of confession. Almighty God, we know that we are all created uniquely in your image. An important reflection of your image reveals how different each of us are. We hear that we were created in your image, but too often we seek to define this image by what we see in the mirror, by how others look at us, and by how we feel. Too often we seek your image in ourselves, rather than seeking your image in our brothers and sisters. This can lead us to a place where we turn our back on your presence, your guidance, and your love. We are prone to division and strife, and do not recognize this as a sin in itself. Forgive us for this way we might stumble in sin, as we now confess our most personal sin to you. Apostle Mark writes in his gospel, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. Remember this command. It is a command given in love. And remember this whenever you hold in your heart frustration or anguish because of what somebody has done to you or someone you love. Let go. Let God be the judge. And now sing with me to God's glorious eternal presence with the glory of pottery. Please rise as we sing. Those 
words mean thank you? You don't. Have you ever said thank you before? Yes, yes. Uh, when have you said thank you before? Do you know, Max? Olivia, do you know? It. Yes, so if somebody gives you something, what do you say? Yes, Olivia, you're right. You said thank you. Thank you. Oh, Gus is there too. Hi, Gus. Thank you for being with us. Oh, good eyes. Okay. And we are coming on a holiday where we eat together and we give thanks. You know what we call that holiday? Thanksgiving, that's right. It's a very literal holiday. Yes, Thanksgiving's great. And who are we thanking on Thanksgiving? write a sermon title. <laughs> That's excellent. And who do we thank for those things? For food and for family, we could thank our parents and grandparents and everyone who is with us, right? Uh, for fall and food and family, we can thank... Yes. We can thank someone very important for all of them. For everything that is good, we can thank someone very important. Who do you think that is? God. That's right. We thank God for all of these things, for all the good things that we have. And one way to thank God is to pray and say thank you, God. And another way to thank God is super important. I want you to listen up. Look at me. Gus, look at me. You good? Okay, good. <laughs> One way to thank God is by treating each other nicely and by loving each other. That is the best way you can thank God. Not just by saying it, but by doing things that show how much you care for each other and love each other. Will you please join me in prayer? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for family, for food, for the fall. And Lord, thank you for teaching us to love each other. Amen. Thank you, Max, for praying with me. Nothing wrong with being out loud. And Miss Angel is teaching today. And what's the best way to teach uh, to thank Miss Angel? By following her instructions and caring for her. <laughs> Poor Gus is now stuck to listen to the message instead of joining Sunday School because we don't have the Sunday School Zoom feed up yet. Maybe in the future. <laughs> but our first scripture lesson comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 to 16. Listen now to God's wisdom and guidance as the words that he relays to Moses and the people of Israel who had just gone through an incredible trial of wandering in the desert and not getting to the promised land. And he's teaching them, God is teaching them how God will love them. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, or death and destruction. 
For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Moses was teaching the children of Israel this and the successive generation that did go into the Holy Land and possess it. But we know in our church history, or many of us do, that there was a successive time of when people transgressed against the Lord and it became too much and they had to leave the Holy Land and then they returned. And then they left again, and it was a terrible cycle of punishment, of stubbornness, of not loving one another. When Jesus comes along, he has a lot of teaching to do. And one of the teaching moments is our scripture lesson from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Listen now to how Jesus teaches his disciples about how they should handle conflict and sin. Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you unleash on earth will be unleashed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. I know that I, uh, the NIV translation is loosed, whatever you loosed on earth and loosed in heaven. I uh, changed to Unleashed, which is a little more intense, I suppose. Um, but it is a, a word that is not so easily translated because it's not often used in our English language in everyday speak. Loose. <laughs> I let something loose. Um, which is why in Greek class when I was in seminary, that was one of the first words we learned was loosed. Uh, and I was understandably confused, but it was a good introduction to the sort of different nature of God's Word in Scripture and how it speaks to us today. But this passage here is really one of the most practical, important ways of dealing with that enemy that we all have, and that is sin. And God's desire for agreement within the church and the power of such agreement. And most especially, how to handle conflict among people. Now, has everyone, has, has anyone here ever been in a disagreement or a conflict with somebody? <laughs> somebody you love, even. Often that's one of the toughest ones. And this passage from Matthew's Gospel is the sort of order of operations when it comes to that conflict, especially in the gathering of believers. Because there is nothing that undermines community more quickly and thoroughly and terribly than unresolved conflict that is not brought out and spoken about and communicated about. It can destroy a community so quickly. And this is true with any organization. As loose as a company, as tight as a family, 
and it has haunted the church as well. A group that is supposed to be a reflection of God and God's image. So, why does this happen? Why is this such an issue? So, the order of operations that Jesus lays out is if somebody sins or sins against you in some other manuscripts, we'll get to that, uh, then bring one, uh, then confront the person. Gently, loving, individually. If they continue in that obstinacy, then bring one or two. Then only if that doesn't work, bring it before the church, before the group of believers. And then if that doesn't work, treat them as a pagan or a tax collector. So, uh, I want to start at the beginning, because often this can be one of the hardest steps. Confronting a person who has either sinned in your eyes against God or sinned against you. Uh, that step is not always taken. How many times have you seen something or heard about something happening and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is not directed towards that person who did it, whether it's a person you know or not, but it's instead talking about what had happened to someone else who might agree with you. This is fairly common as human beings go. You want to talk about important things. And when you hear about something like sin, it is important. As I said, this is something that can quickly destroy a community. But the problem with, with this nowadays is, especially with the advent of social media and the ability to broadcast opinions, is that this whole situation is flipped on its head and turned around. And it's not just a problem with social media, because it's easy for me as a pastor to say, Oh, kids these days and their social media accounts and they're all, well, oh, this is terrible. The world's going to what we know. <laughs> but it's a problem when, whenever people have formed judgments in a group without addressing somebody gently as to who that judgment was about. This is a problem when people gossip and talk about things and share their opinions but do not actually lovingly confront this person. And it leads you to wonder, do they care? Do we care about this person who has fallen in sin? Now, it's easy to pick on social media, and I will, <laughs> because it is so easy to just broadcast something openly. Everybody has an immense power to have their voice heard these days. And it seems like that we start with a sort of pagan or tax collector status from the beginning. Meaning, someone who does not share our opinion on something, who is an outsider, or worse yet, an immoral, unenlightened, or ignorant person. That's what a tax collector or a pagan is to the body of believers. Someone who betrays the faith. So we'll start from the beginning. The first question, when should you speak up and who it is is the person that you are talking to? Jesus starts by defining this, your brother or sister. Your brother or sister in your immediate family. Most importantly, your brother or sister in the family of believers. Where you can share a common understanding or come from a common understanding of love. In care. Supposedly. <laughs> There's obviously a disagreement here. Uh, but in biblical terms, it is repeatedly said of the church that you are not to judge those outside of the church community. Because they are not ours to judge. The Lord will judge. We can lovingly warn, convert, but remember the purpose. 
It is not to judge or condemn. I wish we did a better job of that. <laughs> but if we think about this, if your brother or sister sins, this is a person that you know and a person that you are called to love. This is a family relationship. And nowadays, it's so easy to point out things publicly. Said, so, you know, for example, it's not, it's not if, if the Republicans sin or if the Democrats sin, because we all know they sin all the time. It doesn't matter whose side you're on. If they are of that group, they are in the wrong. But this isn't about that group or other groups. This is about the church. And this is about our relationships with each other as individuals and how that is confronted. So then the second question is, what sin do you point out? And this gets into a deeper issue of what is sin? And I don't know if it's, I, I don't want to say unfortunately, but the fact of the matter is we don't have this neat set of rules like the old Hebrew law that got set down or the Catholic catechism that kind of explains mortal sin or, ve or, or mortal sins or venial sins and kind of gets into detail about that. We don't have that sort of letter of the law when it comes to the church. But there are stories and there's an understanding of good and evil, right and wrong that we can get from scripture and they might not easily be applied to everything under the sun or every situation under the sun, but there is an understanding and consensus that the gathering of believers comes to. So we have two aspects of sin, a sin against God and a sin against you. Now, a sin against the Lord is going against God's desires, and we have to understand God's desires by how we read Scripture and what we understand Scripture to be, that continued guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, this can be harder to define concretely at certain times, but that is why we define it as a group of believers with a shared consensus. And some is very clear. Now there's a sin against you personally. This is actually quite easy to define. It is something that hurts you or offends you personally. And that is where confronting someone individually is very important. Here's the thing, though. You take certain steps, waiting to bring more people into the disagreement. And you don't bring more people into the disagreement. It is to bring consensus. And what is the purpose? To win your brother or sister over. Not to judge them or condemn them or point the finger. It's to win them over to righteousness. So in the be-all and end-all, you treat them as a tax collector or a pagan, and Jesus knows that everyone had to choose at a certain point, and at a certain point you have to leave it behind. But how do you leave it if there is no resolution? Do you just leave it? Do you simply expel that person never to speak to them again? And if we look at the passage here, as Jesus teaches this point, Jesus teaches exactly how to treat them as a pagan or a tax collector, an unbeliever or a turncoat. And it's a pretty harsh sentence, but we have to realize one very important fact from this context. Who wrote this witness of Jesus' teaching? This is from Matthew's Gospel. And what profession did Matthew have before he met Jesus? He was a tax collector. So the question is, how would he want to be treated if he was in such a position because he was in such a position? As someone who still needed to be saved. 
What do you do with somebody who still needs to be saved? You try <laughs> and reach out to them. This instance in Matthew's gospel is preceded by the story of a lost sheep. Does a shepherd not go out and look for that one lost sheep if the 99 are safe? Of course they do. There's great joy in bringing that sheep back into the fold. And it is followed by a very important parable on forgiveness. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Which talks about the forgiveness that we receive from God we have to extend it to others. This is where this story and this teaching is situated. And this is where we need to understand the importance of going through this process or confronting each other individually first. And I want to focus on that purpose of winning people over. And here is the one of the biggest problems with with presenting things and opinions and judgments on something like social media. Social media is public. Everybody sees it. You can say, this is my public stance. And the question that we have to ask ourselves whenever we open our mouths, or whenever we type something into a keyboard, or remember, or whenever we share something in a public forum, the question we have to ask is, what is the purpose behind it? Is it to convince somebody else? Or is it to establish what side we are on? What team we are a part of? Where we stand on something? And I understand that it is important to teach to share your opinion on what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, but what is the best way, what is the best way to win people over to your side? By talking to them, by pointing it out to them individually. Paul, uh, Paul writes in his letter to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own self-interest, but each of you to the interests of others. And what stands out to me in reflecting this passage from Matthew is this phrase, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And if we look at selfish ambition, this could be rivalry. And vain conceit is is something that either makes myself look good and is ultimately meaningless or fruitless. And all too often, a public stance can be fruitless because it falls upon ears that do not understand it. And this can be true outside of the group, for sure, it can also be true inside of the group. When somebody is publicly brought forth and their sin is pointed out in a public matter, and any discussion on social media, this is what it is. That is starting from the wrong place. You start with your individual relationships with each other because you care about that other person who is doing this thing that you disagree with, that you think might be against God or might be against your soul. And then you take it from there. But it starts from a point of care. And we have to remember that what was Christ's ultimate purpose for us, it is a ministry of reconciliation. 
And what did Jesus do? Did Jesus, did, did Jesus only speak or teach about this? No, Jesus gave his life for the worst of sin. We have to remember that. Every time we speak, and every time we address sin, because we have to address it as believers, but we have to know how to address it. And how to win people over to a loving, caring, righteous gathering of believers. And I know we can, because I have seen that same righteousness and love shared with me. I care about all of you the same way. I'm not perfect with how I navigate <laughs> certain forums or, or public ways to speak, like the pulpit, for example. It's not perfect. But that is when I expect you to share that with me, and I would hope to do the same. As we come together, I want us to sing together hymn 557, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation.
that we give our lives to him. So in light of this, we should start wherever we can. Today, church officers will be elected to a life of service through grueling meetings. This leaves the fun work up to you. And there are so many ways to get involved. Here are a few things you may be interested in. Helping deacons with their ministry of hospitality. Helping the building and grounds committee, counting offerings, gardening maintenance. Helping the Christian Education Committee in Sunday School, Nursery, or Junior Church. Help with special events, like setting up the Christmas tree next week. Help with audio-visual equipment, uh, social media outreach, administration. Just ask a deacon and they will put you to work. Uh, still other ways to help out when you come up with different ways to incorporate your creativity, passion, and gifts, and those gifts to bring forth God's kingdom, like the craft show, car show, and the blessing box. Now, I got involved in the blessing box just by helping put it up, and Lori's been really the drive behind it all. Uh, and I mean, I come and help her, you know, put stuff in there, but she initiates almost everything involved with that. And and the deacons are back that strongly too, and a lot of you have already given it so much. Uh, there will be sign-up sheets for some of these things during the congregation meeting, or just ask how you can help there so many ways to help. You're awesome, and together we can be the body of Christ as we minister to our community and the world that surrounds us. Now, Lord, would like to share a few more things about giving and the blessing. washer or dryer 
Um, you, you can't get laundry soap or even fabric softener or laundry soap on welfare. Um, it's nice to have clean clothes, you know? It's nice to smell good. It's nice to have that. And it's nice to know that someone else is providing it for you in Jesus' name to share love with others. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much, uh, Dave and Lori. And now think about those things as we uh, gather and uh, give back to church and listen to Neil play.
before we share this meal, I invite us to pray for one another in using the prayer concerns listed in our bulletin. Please join me. Lord, we come before your table as a people who don't always agree on everything. Lord, our hearts convict us as we strive for your morality and to reflect your truth and righteousness. But Lord, as we come together as one around this table, we pray for all those whom we love and care about. And you call us to love and care about everyone. Lord, we pray especially for those who are suffering physical or spiritual pain. Lord, we pray for their healing. We pray for Marge's sister, for Dale Alexander, for Eric, for Kevin. And we lift up more names to your presence, both silently and out loud. Lord, pull each and every one of these people closer to you and your presence. And Lord, continue to teach us to follow your way and humble ourselves to your will. As we pray these words, your son taught us to pray, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
body of Christ, give it for us. This is the new covenant, sealed in Christ's blood poured for us. And every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember Christ's death until we come again. We come together as a community of believers who profess Christ's death on our behalf and the resurrection of the body. And I want us to come together now and sing the first and last lines of hymn number 347, All Creatures of Our God King. Thank you. 